Hello and welcome back. This is ECG case number 16. Uh, let's have a look at the case this time. Uh, you respond to a 63-year-old male that's got general weakness and unexplained diaphoresis. Now that doesn't tell you a whole lot, but to me, whenever I have anybody with unexplained diaphoresis, I think cardiac. And you have to think that. Uh, unexplained diaphoresis, you know, when I say unexplained, I mean they're not, you know, uh, playing a basketball game or uh, really anxious from, you know, a panic attack or something like that. You have no reason uh, to, you know, expect diaphoresis on this patient. But, you know, that pale, cool, diaphoretic patient that just tells you they don't feel really good, get a 12 lead EKG. A lot of the times they may be having uh, an MI, so get a 12 lead EKG. And here's the EKG that goes with uh, the case. And I know, the first thing you notice, it's really, really ugly. Okay, so... Try to get another 12 lead if you see this. Uh, the, the crew did get quite a few 12 leads, but every one of them is about as ugly as this one. So uh, it didn't really help to get, maybe the patient was shivering. Uh, maybe putting a blanket on them would have helped. Maybe they left the clothes on. I don't know what the case was, but this is the best one we got. So uh, looking at it, first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to identify the rhythm. And I believe... The best place to do that would be in the precordial leads on this particular tracing. So I would I would look over here, and I'd see that uh, it looks like we have some P waves. All right, we do have P waves right there, right there, right there. I don't see any extra P waves, and the PR interval looks pretty constant. Um, as far as I can tell, it looks like it's probably just a sinus rhythm. Okay, so we have the rhythm. Now we're looking at, I mean, it's regularly regular. The rate's not too bad. It's narrow complex for the most part. So I'm going to call it a sinus rhythm. Next thing we're going to look at is the axis. And just doing our quick uh, quadrant method, I would look at lead one. Lead one is positive. And then I would look at AVF, and AVF is negative. So I know I have some sort of left axis deviation. And since lead two, this is a quick little trick, if you have left axis deviation and lead two is positive, if you look at the QRS complex here, you'll see that it, it is, in fact, upright. It is positive. Okay. That means it is physiological left axis deviation, which means it could be just some sort of physiological abnormality or not that abnormal. Um, but if lead two was negative as well, that would be pathological left axis deviation, which would be from a left anterior fascicular block uh, or some other pathology. So we have physiological left axis deviation. Looking at the precordial axis, it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, V1 is definitely mostly negative. Uh, V2, it's kind of hard to tell. Where the baseline kind of straightens out over here, it does look like it is mostly positive. V3, again, looks mostly negative. It, uh, V4, almost isoelectric. So it's not really easy to tell. As uh, many people pointed out, there's a lot of artifact on this 12 EKG. I mean, maybe this is more the baseline for VT2. Who knows? Um, so we can't really tell much from the precordial axis. So let's move on to looking at you know any abnormalities of the intervals. We already said it looks like we have a pretty narrow QRS complex. PR interval looks normal. The QTC uh, is, is pretty normal. Um, so there's nothing really abnormal there. Uh, the T wave looks big. We look like we have high voltage T waves, okay? And if we're looking for ST segment and T wave abnormalities, all right, this T wave is tall, it's got a broad base, and it's symmetrical, okay? Symmetrical T waves are always due to a pathology. A symmetrical T wave is never normal. It doesn't always mean it's an MI, but it's never normal. It could be hyperkalemia, it could be something else. Uh, but it is something to consider. All right, but these tall, symmetrical, broad-based T waves, okay, they make me think of a, a, a hyperacute T wave. All right, now hyperkalemic T waves, very, very narrow, very sharp on top. As you can see here, these are almost rounded off on top a little bit, and, you know, not a whole lot, but they're tall and they're wide. They have a broad base, okay, where the hyperkalemic T waves are generally pretty narrow until you end up in a sine wave pattern. And which looks a lot like VTAC, and that would be really severe hypokalemia. But these hyperacute T waves are indicative of an early in, uh, MI, in this case, an early anterior wall MI. 
Now, not only do you have symmetrical Todd broad-based T waves, but you have that J-point depression. And I understand it is hard to see it due to the, uh, the artifact on this. That's not the J-point. Oops. J-point there, J there, and there. Uh, where it is isoelectric, there, there is a little bit of J-point depression. You can see it best in V3. Look at the ST segment in V3, and you can see it, it is a little depressed. Uh, you can also see it a little bit in V4. And again, these T waves are very, very tall compared to the QRS complex. Look at the size of the QRS complex in uh, V2 compared to the si size of its T wave. Okay? Depolarization and repolarization are usually pretty proportionate to each other. So on the same EKG where you have more depolarization, you would usually have more depolarization. As you can see, V1 has a much bigger QRS complex, but a much smaller T wave. Okay? Um, it, it doesn't usually work out that way. However, V1 is uh, known for having a very small T wave. Uh, anyhow, the J-point depression, along with the broad-based tall symmetrical T wave, is called the Winters T waves. The Winters. The Winters. The Winters T waves. Okay? And the Winters T waves are indicative of an acute MI, most specifically found in these interior, anterior leads, uh, indicative of an early anterior wall MI. So this would cause concern. Okay? You see these tall, symmetrical, broad based T waves, J point depression. You gotta think. Okay, this patient may be having an MI. The diaphoresis is now explained, okay, uh, and get this patient to a cardiac cath center, all right, a PCI facility or STEMI center, whatever you call it. You can't necessarily call STEMI alert yet because there's no ST elevation. However, um, if your agency allows you and you're working for EMS, go lights and sirens to a PCI facility without calling STEMI alert, but send this over if you can transmit, take a picture of it. Uh, tell the doc, whatever you can do to, to kind of clue them in that you're really thinking that this patient is having an MI and hopefully they'll have the cath team waiting for you there, or at least a cardiologist to take a look at the 12 EDKG. Um, if you work in the hospital or if you're a physician, I would definitely consult cardiology right away. I would prep this patient, get nitrates on board uh, if, if necessary, if the blood pressure permits it. Um, aspirin for sure, it's never going to hurt uh, these patients. So get, get the treatments going, get the ball rolling, get the cardiologists on board, uh, and get them to the cath lab uh, because they're definitely experiencing an MI if you have these D Winters T waves, all right, or it's, it's a high likelihood at least. Here is the patient's angio from that 12 EDKG, uh, and you, you can see right here, anterior wall is fed by the LAD, okay, and it's not being fed very well there, is it? Okay, this LAD is occluded right there. Um, and as you can see over here, uh, they reperfused that tissue. The patient suffered, you know, uh, some necrosis to the myocardium, but hopefully not too much. The ischemia uh, was obviously shown on that 12 EDKG with the Winters T waves. The Winters T waves. All right, so now they've got a good, fully intact LAD uh, due to our crew recognizing those T waves and getting the patient to the correct facility. They didn't call STEMI alert, but they sent a picture of the 12 EDKG. As ugly as it was, and if you're an ER tech, you know that a physician will usually tell you, go back and get another 12 lead if you handed them something like that. Um, but th they were uh, astute enough to take that 12 lead and do something about it. They did a cardiac cath, got the, the angio there for you, and uh, they reperfused that tissue. Well, that's the case. If you've got any questions about this case or others, uh, or you want to talk EKGs, send me an email over at paramedicine101 at gmail.com. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't missed or if you haven't seen cases uh, 1 through 15 go back and check them out There's also an EKG access tutorial and a left bundle branch block tutorial uh, for you to check out whenever you get a chance All right. Have a good one. It was fun talking EKGs with you